Senator Tom Cotton, United States Senator from Arkansas. Hello, Senator. Hey, Bill. Great to be on with you again. I'm just a sucker for that Harvard degree. You know, it's just that that's all I need, you know. But as, as John McCain would say, I joined the Army and redeemed myself. Yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, that's right. When my name came up for way back when Chairman of the National Hour for the Humanities, Pat Buchanan wrote a column and said, this guy majored in philosophy, did a Ph.D., and then he went to Harvard. What more do we need to know? Sink this son of a gun. You know? <laughs> anyway, I, I probably, I read it, I agreed, you know? <laughs> agreed. Senator, I want to talk to you about Sentencing Commission, uh, because this is uh, uh, the sentencing guidelines and um, uh, uh, the sentencing overhaul. But first, headline this morning, Iran poised to make billions off country's vast mineral wealth. Iran poised to become one of the richest countries in the world after years of economic sanctions and international isolation have ended. The Islamic Republic stands to make an estimated $700 billion off its vast deposits of minerals. Sir. Well, that's one reason why I opposed the Iran deal from the beginning, not just because it would put them on the path to nuclear weapons bill, but because it would give them hundreds of billions of dollars, not just in immediate sanctions relief, but in long-term growth potential. As you say, they've got vast mineral deposits. They're the only country that straddled both the Persian Gulf and the Caspian Sea basins uh, of oil and gas reserves. So many country, or many companies want to uh, take the opportunity to profit off of those minerals and that oil and gas. I would say, though, to every responsible general counsel and corporate executive and board of director in the United States, but also abroad, you might want to uh, just slow up a little bit because the next administration, no doubt, will at a minimum renegotiate the terms of this deal, if not rip it to shreds. And that could expose you and your company to massive liability if you enter into these kind of long-term requirements and output contracts now. That's interesting. Are they aware of that, uh, of the warning you just issued? Are people thinking in those terms? I've had conversations both with uh, corporate officials as well as former administration experts when it comes to sanctions law. And, yes, there is a real concern around the world that the United States might reimpose sanctions, especially secondary sanctions, not just directly on Iran, but any country or company that does business with Iran. And it's, I think it's important that we remind those corporate officials all around the world, not just here in the United States, who are probably least likely to do business with Iran, that that is a real risk. And it might be in their best interest to wait for seven or eight months until we have a presidential election so they know exactly what that kind of risk oh, will good, impose. Good, good point. Good notice. Fair point. Okay, let's go to the uh, let's go to the sentencing overhaul. This is a bipartisan bill. Interesting guys like John Cornyn, Mike Lee. You're opposed. Why? Paul Ryan? Uh, well, I... So I would not call it sentencing reform bill like, or criminal justice reform. I call it criminal leniency. Okay. The proposal, as passed under the Senate Judiciary Committee and discussed by many in the House of Representatives, would substantially reduce mandatory minimum sentences. It would reduce the number of predicate offenses that could be used to invoke three strikes laws or sentencing enhancements. It would give federal judges more discretion at a time when the Democrats broke the rules in the Senate specifically to pack the lower courts with liberal Obama judges, and it would make all of that retroactive. So the entire premise of this proposal is based on a myth. It's the myth of mass incarceration of low-level, nonviolent drug offenders. Right. That right. myth is simply not true in federal prison. Only, only one-eighth one eighth of all prisoners are in the federal system. And, more importantly, less than one-half of one percent of those prisoners are there for drug possession charges. And that's probably because they plea bargain down. If you're in federal prison for drug crimes, you are almost certainly a dealer and a trafficker, which is built on an entire edifice of violence. And I just don't think we should let violent felons out of prison early, or we should reduce their sentences in the future. We are letting them out early. I mean, we are letting them out early already, aren't we, thanks to President We're, Obama? Yes. Uh, the Sentencing Commission has issued new guidelines and applied those retroactively, and thousands of uh, felons have been let out of the federal system over the last several years. That's one reason why our federal prison system is at its lowest population since 2008, and it's been declining in 2000, since 2011. And it's one reason why you have the kind of heinous crime that happened earlier in Ohio. Yes. A man who, yes. a man who would still be in prison today, but he was released early because of sentencing guideline reforms, and just a few weeks ago, he brutally murdered with a knife a woman and her two young children. Right. Now, I, I recognize that there are a few instances of unjust sentences, that the law doesn't always work in every particular case. The president can pardon someone who has a manifestly unjust sentence. The president cannot bring that woman and her two children back to life.
That's right. Absolutely right. You know, I'm so glad you mentioned the point about drugs because I have been trying to make this point uh, publicly for 10 years, 15 years, about 25 years. People do not go to prison uh, for smoking a joint. Um, uh, drug possession is rarely uh, the charge. When it is, it is always, always, and, and to my understanding, because people have pleaded down. The average amount of possession uh, when people do go to prison uh, for possession uh, is in the pounds, many pounds, hundreds of pounds. So I'm so glad you make that point. But are, are, are the people, let's forget the Democrats that are cut, are the, are the Republicans on the committee enamored of that myth do they buy that do they do they think that is true because these this is a this is a simple matter of fact republicans on the committee were deeply spit split bill uh they split six to five uh for this bill okay. in my conversations with other senators who aren't on the committee or who have not uh, engaged deeply in this issue yet um they were surprised to learn that the bill would release violent felons early and reduce sentences in the future for violent felons they were also surprised to learn the facts i think as more senators and congressmen dig into this issue they'll realize that uh, leniency and sentencing is the last thing we should do. There are, however, genuine criminal justice reforms I would propose we undertake. One is Senator Cornyn's proposal, which is part of this bill, which would help reform prisons. Prisons should not be an anarchic jungle that are a danger sure, to prisoners sure. and guards alike. They should be a place to punish for past crimes and incapacitate for present crimes and deter future crimes, while also offering rehabilitation and redemption to those who want it. Second, we, we should be uh, focused on rehabilitation. For anyone who doesn't get life without parole or death sentence, they're going to return to society. And we want to get them treatment if they're drug addicts. We want to turn them away from a life of crime. And then uh, there's other areas uh, of criminal justice reform on which we could also focus, like overcriminalization or the requirement of a state of mind element in most federal crimes. Those three areas combined would be a very robust, very sound criminal justice reform package. Sentencing leniency is not part of that. Right, Senator Tom Cotton is our uh, is our guest. Um, yes, um, I, I agree, agree, hundred percent. It's also the case that um, I mean, the response that we made in the eighties and nineties to imprison more people for serious crimes has kept us relatively safe, and we have seen crime rates, crime levels, at least up to the present, go down. Yeah, well, unfortunately, Bill, just last week the FBI reported that violent crime uh, had increased again. Yep. And and I don't think it's a coincidence that the, the two big reforms, starting in the late 1980s, building on the work of scholars like um, Jim, Wilson Jim Wilson and right. and leaders like Rudy Giuliani, were mandatory minimums and longer sentences for drug, for, uh, drug trafficking and drug right. dealing on the right. one hand, and aggressive community policing and broken windows policing. And over the last 18 months, We've seen both uh, reductions in sentencing through sentencing guideline changes and changes at the state level and stigma, uh, a stigma imposed on that kind of policing, the so-called Ferguson effect, as FBI yeah. Director Jim Comey has said it. Those two things combined helped reduce the violent crime rate substantially over the last 25 years. Turning away from them, I think, in part, has helped contribute to the increase in violent crime. I agree with you, and I think that's, uh, that's what, that what is what explains this. Is it possible that we will see, and it's a political question, straightforward political question, that we will see this increase uh, hit a point uh, of uh, intensity or um, uh, 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 significant increase that uh, over the next few months that this becomes an issue in the election? Bill, I hope that we don't see a continued increase, um, but if crime does continue to increase, and there's no doubt it will become an issue in the election, public safety broadly defined, both national security and law and order on, our, on the streets across America, are the most fundamental responsibilities yeah. of government yeah. at every level. And if government is not performing that responsibility, then of course the American people are going to demand changes from their elected leaders. Tell uh, these American people who listen to the show, the three and a half, four million, what they should do vis-a-vis -vis their congressman, chairman, senator, whatever. Well, it's very important that senators and congressmen hear from their uh, constituents on this. I can tell you personally, uh, both uh, from my own experience and from uh, working with my peers, the most immediate way to do so is to make a phone call. Um, writing a letter is good. Sending an email is good. If you can uh, get access to someone who's not your congressman or senator, the way the website works, sometimes it's restricted by zip code. But the most immediate thing you can do is to make a phone call. You know, I get regular reports on the people who are calling and their viewpoints. I know that all my colleagues do. Call and tell your representative or your senator that while we want to 
have prison reform. We want to uh, have re- rehabilitation of those who want a rehabilitation. We want to address over criminalization. Right. We should not be letting violent felons back out onto the street. Thanks, Senator Cotton. Thanks for your leadership on this. And uh, as you reminded me before we got on air, I will do my part here. Boy, and thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. Bye.